What we see here is crack initiation. We got Jimmy. Oh no! Look, water's coming. <laughs> water coming through the dam. And then boom! Catastrophic failure. Okay, so we're gonna start out. I mean, right at the beginning of the movie. Kidding that they do a beautiful aerial view. I mean, just gorgeous. I don't know if this is CGI, but you get to see the the the, the towers, the, the the entire system, the scale of the Hoover Dam in comparison to the mighty Colorado. Um, but within that that first shot of that segment, they actually tell you the magnitude of the earthquake. Right. And they don't do that in the, the previous movie that we watched. And why is that so important, David? Well, obviously, the magnitude gets greater as more energy. So, um, if you look at aspects of history, the largest magnitudes have caused the most damage. Okay, so 7.1 is the magnitude of this earthquake. Right. And within... 15 seconds, so you have initiation of that. So he says it's a 7.1 magnitude. That's when that wave hits the dam. Right. Um, and you immediately have this compressive load that shatters the dam. So that happens within 14 seconds. Would you see that, that, that cracking? It would have to be, you know, a movement out to create a cavity to then compress it, right? and cause that poof. Yeah, you know, in earthquakes in history, a, a, a bad earthquake mm -hmm. might be a 30 second record. Right. So, and do we see damage, historical damage in that time period? Well, yeah, we see that, we <laughs> definitely see that. In the Northridge earthquake in California, that was one of the first earthquakes that ever recorded that large vertical wave. And you may recall we had um, shears and columns, right. column, beam and columns. We had shears and some of the bridge connections, and that was from that compressive wave that right. caused that shear. That movement that caused that, that shear load that overcame the capacity of the design and the materials. Exactly. Right. Now, in the Japanese earthquakes, we see records where we see apartment buildings that have a shear plane that looks like a, a failed cylinder. So, it looks like a Type 4 in a cylinder. So you would see, you could possibly see that, I mean, it is, you have a certain angle here as well as here. It's almost like a type 3 break on a cylinder. Right. And then that poofing out, you could possibly see that. Possibly. Right. If we think about the different mechanisms of the cylinder test, as you suggest, that's like a type 3. Uh, pure shear would be a type 4. So, yeah, that's the cylinder test model the different kinds of Failures we might see. The next thing that I absolutely loved is when you go to this next clip, it really is just quite beautiful. They show these outlets <laughs> shooting out water, and when the water hits, it creates this wall. From that, so first of all, let's look at that the outlets. Would the outlets really do that? Would it create, would they do both outlets at the same time, and would it create that wall? And would there be that much pressure to create that wall of water? Well, I think what we're looking at there is the notion that the uh, the gates might fail. Oh gosh! So wow! So if the gates were to fail, it's going to be a sudden sudden release of water. Are they going to be at high pressure? Yes. I mean, there's those outlet works are, are at that gate. Well, they're like what 100 feet diameter, 40 feet diameter, something like that. Well, the ones I don't know about Hoover. I haven't been in the penstocks at Hoover at at Cooley. The penstocks are 42 feet in diameter, yeah. and you stand there in that diameter, that 42 foot diameter, and you look up that penstock stock, and you can see the gates about 400 feet away, 42 feet in diameter, and just this little trickle of water runs down between your feet. That is wild. And it just kind of gives you a, uh, an understanding of how small we are in the world. Well, yeah, and then just the depiction that they do in the movie, you see what I'm saying? That wall of water, assuming those gates fail, if there's that much pressure coming out, that cute, that volume of water creating that nozzle effect. Right. That's why. Yeah, they were probably designed to impact, so it creates a stilling effect. Oh my gosh, and it just drops in exactly. on the other side of the dam. Exactly. That's wild. Okay, so the next piece of that is the bridge failure, and this... I thought was the biggest BS in the movie and, and you see it happening so you see that 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 you know kind of cracking that's going up at a certain angle and then it continues as he runs past 
that open area in the background, you see that the bridge just failing, like at, at I mean, it's failing in sections within the um, architecture of the design. Right. But they're catastrophic failure, David. It's almost like it has no reinforcement. And that's, I thought it would be more of a tearing effect. Well, in the concrete towers on the bridge, uh, they probably are reinforced. That's probably structural. But again, in the Japanese cases uh, with the uh, apartment buildings and whatnot, we saw failures much like that, that look like a sheer failure through a cylinder. Yeah, you can see where the bridge has failed in, what is that, 20, 30 foot sections? Like it's collapsing in yeah. 20, but at the foundation where it connects to the wall of the canyon is where that failure initiated. And it was a cleaving, or <laughs> I love using that word, it was a cleaving of that section that started that ripple effect. Do you mind if we look at it again? Yeah, let's look at that again. See, there it is, boom. Yeah, on the one side we see that remnant mm -hmm. on, on the abutment. So if we have a fixed boundary condition on the bridge, that's going to be more rigid. The arch part of the bridge is probably going to have some structural deflection. So it's going to fail at the most rigid portion, which will be closer to the foundation. Uh, it's going to fail at the position of highest strain, which is the position of highest deflection. Okay, so it would fail actually in the middle first? It would probably fail out in the, the span of, of the bridge itself. So would you say that's a mistake, or am I seeing it wrong? No, we see a remnant. You see the column, we see the on-take structure, the column. Right. And you see the failure initiating to the right of that, which is, oh, okay, which okay. is out okay, in the okay. span. Now, the other abutment looks more like what you're talking about, where it just shears off at the abutment. Okay, but does it have to be perfect? Can it have failure in the middle as well as one of the abutments? Absolutely. I mean, it's going to, that vertical wave, there's no telling where it's going to be more intense. Right. I mean, if the one abutment has to come up through more layers and the other abutment's more uniform, there's going to be more energy delivered through the uniform abutment. So it's not going to dissipate the energy. So it's kind of a matter of the rock structure. Um, and the wave itself. And the wave itself. The energy. Now, I have a great textbook that I left downstairs. Now, at Reclamation, the seismologists there actually do spatially distributed um, ways for the structural analysis. The structures are big enough right, geez. that they do uh, different seismic inputs at different locations around the dam rather than just have one wave come up from great depth because the geology makes a pretty big difference in the transmission of the wave. Oh, of course, of course. Well, the geology, I mean, that. That is what is transmitting, that wave right. attenuation. Right. It has to go through the rock and then the concrete has its own wave attenuation. And right. of course the water, you know, against the concrete, of course there's that joke. Fish swam into a wall, <laughs> what did it say? Damn. Now, it, a great textbook, sorry about that, that goes over earthquake dynamics, not so much dam work. Right. But earthquake dynamics is this one by Chapa Chopra. Um, we'll put a link to that below, but this is what I used in school to learn about how earthquake works and it'll give you a little bit more information on those those waves that we've been talking talking about in these videos. Yeah, Chopra is one of the most famous for sure. Oh no doubt. Okay, so the the last one, it's the final failure or that uh, that smiley face, man. And you just see this this mass of concrete just crushing, not crushing, it's it's not rubbling, it's falling in pieces and this this cleaving, or this, oh this drop-off, this shear wall, this drop-off on the dam itself. Would that happen, and what we learned in the last video, and when we lo looked at the, the isthmus, that would happen? Yeah, again, the numerical modeling technical term for that is the smiley face. So that is common in numerical analysis, it's common in scale modeling, we've never seen it in the real world yet, but we believe that will be the failure mechanism. Okay, and, and one of the things that I'm questioning is the water coming out of the dam. And I would think that with that type of energy and all together the dam, or the dam, the dam earthquake, the dam earthquake, the earthquake lasted, you know, three minutes in this video. 
you know, by the time that it went through that final, fi uh, or three minutes, did I say 15? Three minutes in that video. But if you look back at the original, you know, still of it, and that's what we're looking right now at timestamp 16, so we have about a 20 foot drop from where the, the water looked like it was, maybe 50 foot at the most. Um, but I'm, I'm guessing maybe it's another 25 feet to the top of the dam. So with that type of energy from that type of earthquake and that initiation of the earthquake to the final failure, my question is, just like you would see a, a dam, or not a dam, uh, the energy released during an earthquake in a pool and how water lower in a pool will sometimes slosh out 10 to 15 feet so if you go from that image at that point to the final failure where the water does not go over the sides of that crosswalk, that's my only question. I don't feel like, and I could be wrong, it doesn't hurt my feelings to be wrong, that I feel like the water, there would be enough energy, enough movement that would cause that, that failure that you would see some overflow of the water when you would have final failure. And I just don't know if that's the case. Well, we see the flow through the smiley face. We so, but yeah, but that's lower than the top surface of the dam. Right. So I'm saying water would come over the top surface through the car crosswalk, crosswalk at minute 312. So you're thinking a tsunami wave. Right, 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 totally, totally. Tsunami caused by the magnitude 7.1. It's still a body of water. It's still going to have some energy from that water against the dam, and that energy has to release. Yeah. In the turn again in Alaska um, right. failure, what you're talking about happened that the water weirded over the dam. The right. dam itself didn't fail. In that case, it was a, a fault plane that tipped up like a like a cake pan. Right. And literally just poured the water o over the dam. Sure. And changed in elevation. Um, I suppose it's possible to have a tsunami in a reservoir. I've never seen. Um, never seen literature actually on that. We get waves from landslides. Right, 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 um, right, right, right. But yeah, I, what I'm familiar with is this, you know, lift the gate, let the water out phenomena. And earlier in the movie, in the clip, what's incredibly accurate is you see the splashing, you see like stone drops in the reservoir, they actually right. show that in the movie. Yeah, now an earthquake, of course, has is random. I mean, there's all these different frequencies that come right. uh, from the earthquake. We did the, these tests at the Bureau of Reclamation Laboratories on the shake table. We ran those at a constant frequency. As you change frequency, you had different splashes in the reservoir. As you had higher frequencies, you had more splashes. You had lower frequencies, you had less splashes. So it's just so you would see these waves right here, or something akin to that. You'd see some form of waves from maybe that's a little too clean. shaking of the reservoir. I think that's probably a reasonable uh, approximation. I again, I don't know about the tsunami wave idea. Okay, so. Yeah, thanks for joining us. What we wanted to show was these Hollywood depictions, and on this second video, I mean, I think they did a great job. I'm being very picky on what I would want to see based off of the knowledge that I have from reading these books, but even so, I, I would give, if I would grade these Hollywood movies, I, I would give, you know, uh, you know Superman a, a, a 98, and I would give... You know, San Andreas fall, or San Andreas a, a 98. They both did excellent jobs. Yeah, they must have had a consultant or advisors that knew quite totally. a bit about this. Because, yeah, the, the representation is, I think, pretty realistic from some of the research done. Right, and I'm trying to think of another movie that, that's done this. But uh, there was a movie um, years ago um, with uh, Jake Gyllenhaal, The Day After Tomorrow. Right. And they didn't do anything about the Hoover Dam. They did New York City, but they showed experts helping them create models of water flow through right. New York. And it was trying to get as best of a representation of that tidal wave that, you know, would only happen in a cataclysmic event, but how it would actually flow through New York. Right. And I think they must have done something like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. Well done. Well, well done. done. So thanks for joining us today. Let us know your concrete questions. Go concrete! Be asphalt.